my computer. <laughs> um, cool. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Simon and I am on this Ashoka US team. Welcome to an Ashoka huddle. These are 60 minute curated conversations on a theme. Uh, and oftentimes they're anchored by an Ashoka fellow who's in the midst of it. So today we are with Michelle Mascarenhas Swan of Movement Generation and the theme is democratic leadership. Uh, uh, for organizations or something. Uh, you, you all came because of a really powerful paragraph that my colleagues prepared. And we're gonna try to stick to that. Uh, but before uh, we get to Michelle and, and get some grounding for this conversation, which will then turn into a discussion, we'll have some space for folks to weigh in with where they're at or what they're dealing with around this theme of, of leadership and control and decisions across the organizations that we're part of. Um, we'd love to hear first who you are, uh, maybe like what in a line, in a short line, brought you to this conversation. And then we'll, let, we'll end with uh, Michelle and, and she'll hold the floor for a little bit longer than the rest of you. Um, so maybe if we could, in the order that folks joined, uh, excluding Michelle and myself, that would, ah, this is me. <laughs> um, we will hear quickly from David Flink. Uh, hi everyone, great to be part of the call. Um, David Flink, I've been a Shoka Fellow longer than I can remember. And um, I really came into this work uh, as we are an organization run by and for people who have learning and attention issues. Uh, we match college and high school students who have dyslexia and ADD with middle school kids who have dyslexia and ADD as a way to empower them to find their voice. And when I think about my role now, literally 20 years ago today, I was the first mentor at Ida Eye. Now we work in 150 schools in 24 states. And I don't actually think that I work for my board. So for recording this, they'll hear, it's fine. <laughs> I work for the students in these schools. Mm -hmm. And we make decisions here at Eye to Eye. And in my role as Chief Empowerment Officer at Eye to Eye, I think very strategically about how can I make sure that that is always true? How can every decision we make be reflective of what Students are going through every day in school right now. I'm 38 years old. I have no reason to believe that my experience should inform this if someone with dyslexia and ADD anymore. And so I came to this thinking about how do we do this effectively at scale? And we're not at scale, by the way. We have a long way to go. So just even at this size, how do we do this well? And, and I'm excited to learn from each of you about how you're, you're, you're kind of struggling with this challenge. Great, thank you, David, and welcome. Uh, Karen from Kala in Chicago. Hi, yes, I am a general counsel for Kala, uh, which stands for Community Activism or Law Alliance. And um, we are an organization that um, sort of brings lawyers into the communities and empowers uh, communities and community activists um, by providing them with legal support. Um, and have a uh, uh, commitment to social justice and also to worker empowerment issues. You know, we work with unions, we work on cases to help people with, you know, often low wage workers with employment issues. So I come to this discussion because we at Kala, although we're a small organization, um, probably uh, less than 20 people um, or somewhere around there, I might have the numbers off. Uh, we recently um, agreed to recognize a union of our staff and staff mm -hmm. attorneys, um, which is a small group. It's, it's probably about eight people. Um, but we, you know, we're committed to kind of workers' rights and worker empowerment. And now we're about to embark on the um, sort of process of engaging in collective bargaining. And what I am interested, what the management team is interested in is, is there a way to do this where we can really find the old union models very um, satisfactory for our organization? And I sometimes kind of, as we work through it, I kind of question whether they work in many situations mm -hmm. because it seems like people get put into camps, it becomes adversarial. And um, I am sort of interested in finding maybe different models um, that we can use to help make sure that everybody who works for Kala is being respected and has a voice 
um, but that everyone also feels really invested in the organization. And there's just a lot of issues that, that go into that. So I'm hoping to learn something here. <laughs> well, thank you, Karen. Uh, and both, the, both Karen and David for modeling, yeah, the, the experiences that we're bringing you here and some of the questions that you're coming into the call with. Uh, Sarah, you are in motion, but uh, we'd love to hear from you as well. Yes, and my coworker Chris is just about to join as well. Okay, perfect. Um, so we were both at the Sustainable Economies Law Center, which was founded by an Ashoka Fellow, Janelle Orsi. So that's how we heard about this. Um, and we are a democratically run nonprofit. Um, and so my interest personally is just that this is the only democratic <laughs> nonprofit I've ever been a part of. So I'm interested in hearing about other models. Um, I'm also actually on the board of, I just joined the board of Pangea Legal, which is a, a, another um, democratically run organization, and I'm providing a training for their board coming up um, in next month. So I'm also just kind of looking for other ideas and models um, to share with them. Wonderful. Welcome. It's Chris. Uh, well, maybe we'll move to the 608 number. Is that Southwest Wisconsin? Yeah, uh, that's Rachel Armstrong here. Oh, hey, Rachel. <laughs> you took your phone up to... Yeah, I still keep the 608 number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, Rachel, uh, in Duluth, Minnesota, if you could just chime in. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yep. So uh, my name is Rachel Armstrong, um, and my organization is Farm Commons. We're a really small team, um, and we exist to change the way business law is practiced in the United States. Um, and we're doing that in sustainable agriculture. We are creating ways for farmers themselves to define the legal solutions that they want in their paperwork and, uh, and business regulatory matters. Um, as a small team, we're pretty able to just go around in a circle and be like, well, what do you think? What do you think? Um, and it works pretty well. And, you know, we just operate mostly by consensus, assuming that the board hasn't given us some other direction um, that we have to adhere to. But as the team grows and as I look to become a, a tighter ship operationally, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to have something more than just, you know, what do you all think um, for, uh, for consensus-based decision making. Thank you, Rachel. And Rachel, on October 15th, when we announce our new Ashoka Fellows for the year, you're going to see a familiar face in Rachel and in Karen's colleague, Long. But this is just like a spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> Chris uh, is popping into the frame. Hi, friends. Sorry for being late. Interesting introduction. Should I introduce yeah. myself? Yeah. Short introduction. You can say that. You can say just your name, but other folks had the invite to share. What about this call is particularly interesting? Cool. Well, I'm Chris, and um, the answer to that is Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> and also because um, I nerd out on decision making and structures for participation all the time. Uh, at the Sustainable Economies Law Center, we've helped organize something called the Nonprofit Democracy Network, which is working to support and develop more decentralized practices, specifically within nonprofit social justice organizations. And so looking for practical tools to implement broadly shared uh, values is something I am interested in. Wonderful. Well, welcome everyone. And then uh, Michelle, I know you may have, uh, it'd be great for you to do the same, to, to chime in and what brings you to this call, but also just to keep the mic for as long as you need to introduce folks to um, movement generation. I think the moment that we're in, you know, with your work and from your perspective, how that informs your work as an org, some of the models and some of the responses to some of the prompts that were offered up here. Uh, but all of that will come out naturally. I'm going to be quiet and I'm going to pass okay. the break over to you, Michelle. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks, Simon, for jumping in. Also, Annie um, helped, I know, curate this, yeah. this huddle. And um, yeah, so a little bit, I mean, I'm also just like really excited to hear more from you all and talk <laughs> more. It sounds like there's just a lot of experience and um, wisdom of folks on this call. So I'll try to keep it kind of short. Um, I guess, you know, just to start, I think I, as many of you all have had, like, you know, I, I think it's interesting, first of all, to say that the folks on this call are folks that are already in practice in real time with 
um, democratic decision making. So it would be interesting to look at the Ashoka Fellows and, mm -hmm. and spaces where that's not happening. Um, I'm just curious about that. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't need to say that much more. About, like, I just feel like we all have experiences as folks who have been put in leadership roles um, in nonprofits that where our drive is really about the thing that we're doing, not about being managers or executive directors or, you know, something like that. And, um, and yet the, the kind of the structures kind of force us into replicating hierarchical processes that ultimately don't make a lot of sense in terms of um, supporting our, like, our communities, our peoples in really stepping into our full power mm -hmm. um, and agency. So I think that's like at the root of, it sounds like what we're all trying to do, right, is, is how, um, how we're shifting decision making to really uphold this idea of no decisions about us without us which is at the core of, you know, the work that everyone is just describing mm -hmm. on this call, um, you know, and then that we can't implicate of anyone's labor without their consent. That's like a very low common denominator. But then beyond that, it's like, how do we, um, how do we really support building a culture in which each person can really bring their full humanity and their full mm -hmm. uh, their full gifts to the work and you know i think that the dichotomy of like the system often wants our this like extractive economy often just wants our brawn like you know certain workers are just supposed to be muscle in the machine the wheels of the machine other workers are supposed to just have like a part of your brain that you bring every day and so I think in everything that we do, it has to be about expanding our capacity as humans to bring more of ourselves, like bring more emotion and feeling, bring more of our gut and our instinct, um, you know, bring the rest of the wisdom that we have acquired um, through ancestral knowledge, through, you know, all of our experiences. And, um, you know, this week thinking about it as like, you know, it's just obvious, it's so um, present for me about who's in power and the kinds of experiences that they are not bringing, you know, to the kinds of decisions that are being made and the spaces where women and gender oppressed people are having conversations about what we're seeing in the news happening, you know, at these hearings, just as an example, um, how actually critical it is for those experiences and voices to be um, not just like a part of the decision but but central to to it and so I don't know that's just like um, in terms of framing I feel like it's really about like building a culture of trust um, of high standards of work and high standards of care mm -hmm. um, a high regard for each other and then just like I think probably what all Ashoka fellows are, are in some ways is like well, there need to be people that are providing like that are creating the glue mm -hmm. right the glue that seeps in between um, the teams the folks the projects the relationships you know and that I think one of the things that we have to get better at is actually seeing that glue because glue mm -hmm. dries invisible when it dries well and then it's very easy for founders, executive directors, or people, even if they're in um, democratic roles and you know democratic leadership processes, for that to be unseen, unnamed, and um, you know not coded in a way, or not coded is the wrong word, but you know like just um, how do we how do we really articulate what that glue is and what and then help build skills or identify it. Um, in others that are bringing those gifts and skills and cultivate it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to share a little bit more about some of our processes, but I'm not sure if that's right for the call. Like, I'm happy to also to just hear more questions. So, I know, yes, Michelle, I mean, you, feel, you feel like you're preaching to the choir and that folks here are, are on board, you know, I think, and, and even I'm watching the other heads nodding. Um, but it, could you, I mean, 
let's pretend that somebody comes to me next week and they just missed this conversation and they're on the fence with how they're going to, I mean, they want to go in this direction, but they have a board and a team and fears around sharing what their salary is with their colleagues or I mean, what, all the different stuff. So could you just spend a minute on like what, and not, it's not even framed as a shift in your case, but what has this mode of decision-making and this culture, this, this glue at movement generation or in your life meant for the work that you're doing to help someone, you know, who might be on the fence. And then we'll do exactly, you know, then we'll, then we'll weigh in with other experiences. But what is the, and I know you're so deep in this, like you can't see another way, like the other way of doing it is the problem statement. But yeah. what is, like what uh, happens, what, you know, what does it feel like to be in an organization, to be a human and on a team that has this, you know, this set of values under, uh, not undermining, under, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I mean, I think the the most important thing is that um, you know I use this word of these words of like trust and regard and care, mm. and those are things that are so often absent from the way folks are treated in in the world, and I think this moment on the clock of the world, as Grace Lee Boggs terms it, you know actually requires us to build containers of safety, dignity, and belonging. Like that's the crucial thing that we have to be doing. And so if our organizations aren't doing that, we're just part of, you know, we're, we're part of the system that is mm -hmm. pushing people into isolation or um, not being able to show up with their full humanity, not feeling like they have the right to make decisions about their own labor and about the, you know, all the things that are impacting their life, their family, their kids, their neighborhoods, you know, their schools. Um, so I, I just really firmly believe that like in every space that we are a part of, we have to be um, creating more yeah, containers of safety, dignity, and belonging. And that kind of framework of safety, dignity, and belonging comes from, um, for me at least, comes from generative somatics, which I'm, a, I'm in the teacher training program of. Um, and, you know, when any, any one of those things is severed is when trauma occurs. Um, often for many of us, um, several of those things are compromised at different points. And we develop, um, responses that first are instinctual and then become learned and practiced behaviors to stressful situations, which are coming at us all the time. And it's only when we have enough trust in the like belief that the people around us actually care about us and enough to um, see that like, okay, I've made a mistake or I'm showing up in a way that I don't really want to be showing up um, or I can see that the way I'm showing up is harming you and some, is hurting you in some way or not constructive to the organization or whatever. But if we don't feel like we have the, the space to be held in that as like, and I'm still worthy of love, you know, I'm still worthy of your care and respect and being part of this team, then we don't get the chance to show up fully you know mm -hmm. we don't get the chance to um to see that as like okay that was my response and i can have a different response that's not going to be hurtful to you or that's going to be constructive for the whole organization or that's going to actually support me building my capacity even outside of the space you know um so that's i think what having a a democratic decision-making and shared leadership structure um, creates. It creates both the space for us to heal, like heal from a lot of the hurt that's been caused, even in nonprofit structures, um, because we're not seen in our full humanity, um, which requires processes, like lots of processes, direct communication, um, we have like peer support structures. Um, we now have like a right relationship to gender process that's taking on patriarchy directly in our interpersonal and organizational and external relationships. Um, we, um, you know, we, we 
involve everyone in like the vision setting at the planning committee level. So all staff are involved in that like long term direction setting as well as the the sort of year to year and ongoing program um, planning. Um, and then, you know, you have to have like a lot of channels, I think, for like, again, the, just like you have glue organizationally, you also have to have glue relationally. Um, so we like schedule in staff lunches, you know, once a month and as busy as everybody is, like actually important to just check in over, you know, and especially for organizations that are, um, that are virtual or that, you know, where folks are in different um, locations. Um, I've heard of organizations also doing things like just, just having care calls um, once a month where it's almost like the water cooler call, you know, space is created for folks to share what's really going on in their lives. Um, Cause if you don't know that stuff, and then of course, like the basic stuff, like we always check in at the beginning of meetings and, um, and so just like creating that culture of care, um, I think is really important. Yeah. What I love about this, uh, it was the frame is it's actually bigger than just our team because the vision of where we need this kind of way of interacting with other people in the world isn't just in our professional teams, it's in all of our human grouping. So in, in that case, I think we can, we realize that we probably all have ways in which we you know, uh, can apply this work to other spheres or other teams in our lives. Can I ask like one other sort of fun, sort of intro question and then I'd love to have others jump in with if you're sitting on some questions yourself. And this would be just my personal experience. I've been with Ashoka for like 10 years um, and there's like the entrepreneur sort of fast and decisions and you know, there's that, there's that typical way of just, a, there's a typical pace and a typical ego and a typical sort of like uh, way of, of working in teams, you know, boards that are designed by the entrepreneur to just, you know, clear barriers and allow everything to keep going fast. Uh, and I'd internalized a lot of that. I live in a small town where there's a lot of slow and, 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 and more consensus and more democratic leadership and more um, space for everyone to check in even, which takes 10 minutes or whatever, you know, and, and like, but, and, and so this is like, I under, I know that this is the, um, there's a different culture, there's a different vibe, and, and I can see the value in all of that. But is there, what are the hurdles, what are the humps we have to get over? And is it just a different way of like decommodifying our time or thinking differently about where we need to be investing in each other in time or any just straight up like, you know, pros and cons. And on this side of the white chart, you know, we are going to lose some speed or we're going to lose some, you know, um, whatever it is, like uh, the, the, the dark uh, side of any of this, if, if at all. I'm not sure how to get you to say something. Yeah, really no, I mean, I think you're <laughs> saying, you're like answering the question, of course. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Way, but like, yeah, I think, um, so time is always a challenging dimension for us. Mm -hmm. um, we, in a way, are like 10 EDs sometimes, you know, because folks have such, leadership capacity and then we make we have bold visions and ambitions for what we want to move in the world and our teams have the capacity to do that and so um we will find ourselves in the situation where we're moving multiple things at one time and we don't actually have the time to mm -hmm. really check in deeply and make sure are we still on the same page or how did this thing rub you or like you know um, so we certainly haven't perfected the dimension of time, yeah. um, or like our relationship to it. Um, and what we find is if we don't, um, you know, like this last month, for example, has been a really, uh, super busy time for us. And then we had four days scheduled where we were just together, um, and did like, this is part of our, um, our, our strategic plan right now, like the, what it calls for in this year is to do a deep dive together. So we were in deep study together in, um, you know, with a group of other folks that were training us up, but that then created, I think some cushion for us to be like, okay, we're, um, you know, even if we're going, going, going for some time that it's just like the natural cycles and rhythms of, 
you know, of the earth, like you can go pretty hard. Like, you know, some of us were in Alaska last year and, you know, when the sun is up almost 24 hours, you feel like you're a superhero and you could just go, go, go. Right. But in the winter people hell asleep, you know? And, um, I just think that we need to be more real about cycles and rhythms and seasons and flows and that that has to take place in a long arc of time. And I think what you're getting at around the entrepreneurial model is, um, which I agree with, is like there's a very short term outlook often um, of like we need a magic, you know, like the silver bullet kind of thing um, rather than the breath of solutions that are going to come from a more democratic and um, flat you know, it's like more things happen. I, I like to think about, um, actually think about water systems, it's actually a routine there that we've been learning from for a long time. Can you hear me okay? Yes, there was an amazing like time warp when you talked about <laughs> like, we need to do things, which is amazing. Okay. <laughs> about time, but you're back. Okay. You're um, so the, the metaphor is, you yeah. know, our industrial water systems are all about um, piping, pumping, and polluting water, you know? So we pave the land and then it just gets, you know, uh, it just flows right into the storm drains and out into the ocean and we like lose so much um, of the capacity. But really what we need to do is retool our water systems and our watersheds to slow it, spread it, and sink it, right? And I think it's a really good metaphor for our organizations and for our movements. You know, how are we um, not just like trying to streamline and, and get things moving in like one direction for efficiency sake, um, because efficiency often leads out all the, the, the tentacles and the, you know, like it's really beautiful, David, to hear about the organization that you're a part of. You know, it's like the young folks in our schools who have, um, you know, learning or attention um, difficulties, like they're the antenna for our kids. <laughs> you know, they're like the skin on our body collective who, if we're not paying attention to them because they're, they're, I mean, I don't need to tell you this, but right, like I feel it as a parent whose kid is able to sit still for six hours listening to a grown up, and I'm like, what? That's what you do all day? And yet she sees the kids who aren't able to do it. And she's like, well, kind of sucks that we have to do this. <laughs> and like, it doesn't really work because the teacher has to yell, is yelling at people or sending people to the office or, and it's like, well, actually they're the antenna and they're the ones that are like, the alarms are going off saying this is not working. This is not good for us. And, um, and so like efficiency would tell us you just do the thing that works, you know, for like, for the system, but a slow it, spread it, sink it model is like, wait, let's tune into what these folks are saying over here. <laughs> like, what are, what's, you know, let's really listen and let it sink in and then um, try out some different things. This is also like an approach of permaculture, right? It's the idea that you and all like permaculture comes from land-based peoples everywhere who design um, their living system, you know, their communities in relationship to the needs and also like a reflective, responsive relationship to place. So it's like we do something on a small scale and we test it out and we're listening and like, is it working? Is it, you know, what are the impacts? What are the, you know, both po like positive and negative? Like, um, how could we make it a little bit better? How could we make it so that, you know, there's more, um, more of a win-win or, you know, like all of those things. Um, I think that's the kind of cultures we need to be building in our organizations to really take in the greatest amount of experience, knowledge, wisdom that's coming from all these different parts of us. Um, and then, and then be like, just move, you know, we'll just move much more, um, I just think in much more concert with the living world, which is what we actually need to be working with rather than against. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to get some new, uh, some not new, some additional voices here and uh, 
my sense is like inspired by your treatment of David's work. Everyone's going to say, can you talk about my work uh, with colorful metaphors? And, <laughs> uh, and I love hearing the, the connections already. Um, but David, I mean, are you, you're big on the screen. Did you do something? I'm just about, I'm just curious. <laughs> so one of the things that's striking to me and I'm really appreciating sort of the framework that's been presented here is where we put the antenna. Yeah. Because I think, to, to use that metaphor, because I think <clears throat> I've witnessed enough organizations and, and to use the, the, the point of the entrepreneur as the beginning sense of this, usually the antenna began, I, my senses in spending time with Ashoka folks, is somewhere within the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur had some signal go up. They saw something no one else saw and they created something, a vision, right? And then it's at scale and then suddenly we as entrepreneurs who came in the business of running a business as opposed to like leading a vision, we bring in professionals to lead the business so that we can lead the vision. And in my case at I'd I, you know, we've planted the antenna continuously, not within the staff. You know, the staff works still to this day for the students. We planted the antenna with the students. And you can, I, I'm curious how people handle this because you could easily argue, look, there's plenty of antennas in my office too, right? I could ask everybody here, if my staff, what they think. But we collectively have agreed that it doesn't matter what we think. That was our democratic process. Because as soon as we got out of the schools, like we committed to the idea that while we may have had an opinion when we, because at I, I should mention, we deliberately hire people who have learning and attention issues. So we are an organization run by and for people who have learning and attention issues. 80% um, of our staff has a learning and attention issue, but 20% that doesn't, make sure that we show up at meetings on time and that our emails are spelled properly and stuff like that. And it's a great team, but collectively, the team is irrelevant. We serve the students, and so we put the antenna with the students. But that was a choice, and it was a hard choice. And there have been people who've come in on team and said, look, you know, I disagree with that. Like, I'm an adult here, they're kids, why should we be letting them lead this, right? And that's a choice. And so I'm curious in, in how other folks, I'm not saying we're right or wrong, I'm just sharing how we've done it. And by the way, I can give you a million examples of how this has gotten us in trouble. Um, and some examples of how this has served us well. I'm curious how other folks deal with that. I mean, you, my sense is you cannot put information gathering at every point. You have to make choices because you're going to get conflicting information. So how do you put where you get the information that leads against an original vision that every one of us who were social entrepreneurs began with? How that, that data feeding uh, functions well in a democratic way. Um, because that's where I, at least personally, I've been doing this work for 20 years now, and that's where I see the tension now at, at this size, in that I could listen to the wrong position of people, and they wouldn't be wrong in their opinions, they would be wrong in their data, but they wouldn't send us in the direction because they're not closest to the problem. And for me, like, I, I'm in the interest, I, someone said I, I lost track which, which of you did, but like, I'm in service of solving a problem. I don't care if my organization ceases to exist in 20 years. As long as we solve the problem, I see it a win that eye to eye ceases to exist. If we didn't solve the problem and eye to eye still exists, then we got work to do. So, so how do other folks deal with where they get the information, how they use that in a democratic way, um, as you continue to grow, how those layers get put into place to continue to care for the care and feeding of everybody who signed up for this, including staff and donors and volunteers. But, you know, so how, how do other folks ad address that? Well, um, I'll just, this is Karen. Uh, I'll, I don't know that we have figured out how to address it, but I guess I would just throw another issue that I think you kind of were alluding to at the end that I think we struggle with a little bit is, so we have clients and community partners in the community for whom we provide legal services. And our model is deliberately set up so that we let them take the lead on you know, what services they need and what kind of legal help they want and how, what role they want lawyers to play. Because we think that's how lawyers can have the greatest impact on social change, not by trying to lead it ourselves, but trying to be in service to those who are leading the movements. But, um, but what we do, I think there's, always, there's a tension there. So in that sense, like antenna are on the outside with our community partners and our clients, but it can sometimes put stress on the inside, on the people, um, and in our case, lawyers, 
often or staff who are working for those partners and how do we, um, they may then feel like they're overworked or getting whipsawed or they like are dealing with unreasonable demands or, you know, so, and I don't think we've figured it out because for us sometimes it seems like the more emphasis we put on serving our ultimate clients, which is our mission, that we run the risk of burning our people out. Um, and how do we balance those needs? But then we also don't want to do the opposite where we're only looking out for ourselves and our own, you know, internal staff well-being. So I don't know if other organizations have, have come up with, you know, solutions there or have struggled with that. I'll just add that that's the tension. I think you articulated in a very good way much of the tension I just described too. I'm happy to share some of the things we've done, but I don't want to monopolize the conversation. I'll just say there's a way of hearing each of your questions around how do we avoid conflict, you know, so that we don't get conflicting information and how we don't create factions of like, these are the folks who are asking for something from these guys who have to provide it and there's a conflict there. So for me, there's maybe a potential response to these questions or prompts and I would look to you Michelle around what are the systems for conflict resolution or, or just maybe we don't really resolve every conflict we just live with conflicts in a, in a different way than we're used to and I, I, like that's where my mind goes as a possible like way to get our arms around these big questions other uh, but yeah I don't want to cut off other folks who have other ways of hearing what you're saying and jumping in yeah, I'm happy to wait for a second and see if other folks do have other things to share. I mean, I think I think that question, Simon, about conflict is a good one, but I also think that y'all are asking, like, structurally, what are ways, right, to, or at least, um, Karen, maybe I heard this more in your question, is, like, structurally, how do we actually um, create mechanisms where those things aren't, um, where there's more, there's more clarity across the system about what the constraints and needs are, right? Um, I mean, I'm curious about that. Like, do you have strategic, like in your strategic planning process or are there advisors or like an advisory body of the movement groups that you're serving who are closer to the organization and help guide the development? Um, no, not so much. So the, the community partners that we serve are not, um, not necessarily the ones who are on the board. You, you know, it's not, um, I think, um, and Lam would probably be better positioned to answer this as far as, I think, I know there might be some funder and donor organizations or related, uh, maybe not, but maybe someone in that community, but there's no, um, the activist groups that we serve, um, by and large, they're a fairly scrappy group too, and they don't necessarily, you know, um, have time to serve on boards. Like they have a, often they're just really grassroots organizations focused on their mission and they're on their board. So they're not necessarily serving on our board. Um, so I think the answer there is, is maybe no. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think, I don't know if it's also something that happens um, maybe in this sort of attorney client um, situation, although it sounds like it happens at eye to eye too, that there's just, when you're providing services to, to a client, there is always going to be a little bit of a tension there. Um, and you, you have to figure out a way to, to navigate that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would push back a little bit and just say that, like, I think y'all are, like, I do think that the roles that you're playing do give you a vantage point on, like, both on the, on the situation that is important to be a part of the, you know, of the, of, of what you're, of the decisions that you're making. And so the question is just, like, how are you creating structures for the base of folks to um, be a part of understanding or being able to bring forth their own like visions, needs, desires, and also understand the constraints of the organization. 
right? Because that's where, I mean, it doesn't have to be a board. It could be an advisory body. It could be just a focus group or whatever. Um, well, maybe it would be helpful. I'll just sort of share, like maybe to bring it into very concrete terms, you know, like a specific kind of issue that, you know, we encounter Kala and maybe there's similar types of things. You know, very specifically, you know, if we have a client in the community who is maybe missing appointments or, you know, not meeting with their attorney on time, the attorney is then getting frustrated. Um, but then maybe the community folks are feeling like we are being too rigid and not helping enough. Or so then you wind up either you say to your attorney, hey, we got to give these people one more shot or another shot. We have to be really flexible. And then the attorney is feeling like you're I'm getting burned out. I'm getting worn down. My needs are not being respected because you're making me go out again and again. Um, and I, you know, so I think that's, you know, that's like a concrete sort of example, or you could even say like, um, in terms of quality of work for an attorney, like you're doing this work for a client, you have a certain quality of work that you need to provide to that client, you know, and if they aren't providing that quality, then what do we do? Because they may feel like they have good reasons and it's, it's too hard or it's too much or they have too many cases. So we have that, but then we have our clients who also deserve to have excellent, excellent representation. Um, and then put on the backdrop that we don't have infinite resources <laughs> and we have eliminated other people. So I think that's kind of the push and pull that we, um, we experience. I'm kind of curious, Rachel, about Farm Commons and how y'all are solving. I imagine that farmers have, well, first, Rachel, are you, are you on? Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. I'm just, I'm curious how, I mean, it feels like there might be similar structural questions. Like I'm sure farmers have many, many, many changes that they want to see in, um, in business law. And so y'all could be doing flips all day and night um like how do you how do you address these questions of like um setting setting direction right in, in that balance yeah yeah absolutely we we experience a lot of this um and um like Kala, i mean we ex we exist to democratize uh, business law for people so that they're they can express their values live them out through their businesses and their paperwork um, and there definitely can be can be conflicts that arise. For us, the most often source of conflict is risk. What kind of risk are we willing willing to tolerate? And although on one hand it's nice to say that we can hand over risk determination to the client, we we are this is a regulated industry. We don't have all the freedom in the world um, to do. Uh, you know, to hand over everything to, to clients because we could be barred from practice um, if we violate the rules that, that govern our own conduct. So there, there is that, and I have to admit that that's, that's totally what I say. Um, you know, I'll tell people, uh, like, I, I have responsibilities to, um, to other people, whether I like it or not. I mean, a lot of times I, I don't like it, and I wish we could rewrite those rules. Um, the industry itself hinders the client-centered practice. Um, but that's another matter for for another day. And when we've got to write a document, um, it's it's kind of like what you said about, well, look, I mean, I have needs, and um, and we need to meet my needs as well. Uh, while you were explaining um, the push and pull of that, I was I was reflecting on how it seems like the procedures for for um, enacting democracy most just revolve around communication. We just need to, we need to understand ourselves and we need to articulate it. Um, and that there's, there's no like, you know, there's no bylaws provision, because that's how I think, you know, no bylaws provision that's going to get us to democracy. That's, you know, kind of going around and around on, on, you know, a healthy communication based on um, understanding yourself and being able to articulate it. 
which was, you know, I'll admit when I realized that about three minutes ago, I was like, oh man, there's no, there's no procedure. But, you know, it's okay. <laughs> Everybody's waiting for you to like list the tools, like turn on your PowerPoint, Michelle, and give us the hyper all the solutions. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Give me the template. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's 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 so it's so intoxicating to think that there might be an answer. But it, you know, at the same time, and what I'm always telling farmers is, well, the good side of this is you have every tool right there at your disposal right now. You don't need anything else. Doesn't make it any easier, but you know? I mean, I'll reference a resource I remember reading a long time ago that I found helpful, which is a book by John McKnight uh, called Community and its Counterfeits, I think. And he laid out a framework, uh, ABCD, asset-based community development, right? Oh, yeah. I'm sure probably everyone has heard it, either of him or of that. Whenever I struggle with these kind of moments, I remember the whole purpose of my organization is to serve this community and they have assets and my job is to serve them so if something goes awry it's never it cannot be my staff like we have to serve them that's our purpose and if what we're doing isn't serving them then we have to change they're they're not responsible for change they have tons of assets and our job is to find out how they want to activate against those assets and our job is also to help them realize that they have assets right and so, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but when I struggle, particularly with conversations internally with staff, and I just am reminded, I'm saying, look, it's a conversation we're having serving the people for whom we exist for better. And if that conversation, we need separately, obviously, to care for each other. And we need processes and practice that, that is very well understood and not often executed well to make sure that we listen to each other and care for each other and give each other what we need and we don't get burnt out and we treat each other equally and fairly and transparently within the organization. That is a different set of procedures than remembering why we exist. And whenever we're having a question about uh, conflict between the organization and those we serve, those we serve always wins out in my opinion. And I, at least at eye to eye, that's been our solution. We like, wait a second, why are we having this conversation? Are we serving our people better? No? And we got to figure out how to serve our people better because that's our job. That's our charter. That's why we exist. I don't know if that helps at all, but the, that, that framework of John McKnight, which is that's very important mm -hmm. work now, has always helped reground me and reground us when I feel we've gone a little off course. Simultaneously making sure that you're, what is essentially in my mind, a set of good HR practices continue to get implemented and get better year over year, day over day. Well, it sounds a little bit too like you just have to, and I'd be interested to know um, how this is, is sort of done on the ground, but that you have to kind of early on, um, everyone has to be committed to that vision. Understanding what that vision can entail and the sacrifice that that can entail for individuals. And so that's... Um, I mean, because if everyone's aligned on that vision, that's then it works. But it's, if if they're not, then 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 it might not work. Then you've got you know conflicts issues. And I think that's our job, uh, and on the management team, and particularly as social mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. I mean, when I think what is my unique role, what I show up to every day, just because I set that course twenty years ago does not mean I still every day my job is to remind and bang that drum, and it's hard. It's a hard, it's sometimes you're like, we haven't solved it yet. I don't understand why haven't we solved it yet. And yet that's our job to say we can solve it. We will solve it. Yeah, we've had to weave and dodge and change and Simon's point, like ask people to move barriers out of the way more quickly and we are driven to do it really fast. But like our job is to remind people that we can get there and that we will get there, but we have to get there together. Michelle, how does that, in, in some of the more democratic uh, processes that I feel you've kind of really shown with a lot of care, um, a lot of thoughtfulness, particularly good empathy, which I know is a, a, a superpower that uh, Ashoka kind of recently discovered that we all have. Like, how does that play out in, in the work that you've seen? Um, how does it play out, meaning? Like this tension between uh -huh. internal process and serving a, a larger community 
Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. So we're one of the founders of the Climate Justice Alliance. So that alliance is the space that we participate in equal to as an, as an entity to other organizations that um, including the majority of which, vast majority of which are frontline grassroots um, base building organizations and that mostly are coming from um, communities impacted by extreme energy or waste incineration or, you know, those kinds of things. Um, but which of course face like a huge intersection of <laughs> all the things. Um, and so creating structures where, well, A, where we show up in our modes of practice and that help to inform the political framework. So like our role in the ecosystem is about um, kind of like writing down frameworks and, and then creating curriculum and trainings and informing um, the development of these vehicles like the Climate Justice Alliance in ways that really carry out that framework. Um, in the spirit of slow it, spread it, sink it, that takes time. And it's a, and it's a like, it's, it's a very reciprocal and relational process. It's not like those frameworks come from our, as movement generations, like brain trust or something. Like those all come from being in deep relationship with folks over decades. Um, and like none of us have cracked, like how are we gonna transform the system, right? Um, and, but, but that's what we're constantly like learning and innovating together. And so those tensions always show up, like in the Climate Justice Alliance, those tensions are showing up all the time. Like we just put a shit ton of resources into this Global Climate Action Summit that happened in California last week. Um, well, we as the Climate Justice Alliance, um, when we have many other priorities that we're trying to lead on that are coming from our own like visions and, and belief like okay if we want to get there you know then we've got to create our own path we can't just constantly being responding responding to external um forces right and yet so i mean that's an example of the tension um and in that week of actions how we showed up mattered right so the way that we so like once you decide to do something um really doing your best to follow through with having your values lead the way you show up. I think that was one of the things that the staff are incredible in like creating that kind of like the space for folks to really show up with their full, you know, there's like lots of music and song and dance and color and art and like joy. And um, even as we're like locked down in the streets, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think that then just, you know, creates more space to have those kind of disagreements then, you know, because now is the time where we're going to be assessing, like, was it worth it? Would we want to do that again? You know, like, how far off course did we get with, you know, the 10 things that we agreed to do this year? Um, and I think it's like, now those conversations still need to happen, but they're, but they're informed by like, um, having some shared practice in a culture and spirit that we're trying to build. So like, that's actually the long game is the processes and the culture and the way we treat each other is what makes every decision the right one, whether it's the right one or not. You know what I mean? Like, um, cause those things are going to come and go and we're going to go through these, you know, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to allocate our resources incorrectly all the time. And what matters is how we show up for each other in that conversation. Yeah. I'm struck by how clear you were able to articulate which roles you did play and which roles you weren't going to play. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that alone took a democratic process internally. Yeah. yeah, that, I mean, that, yes, absolutely. Both internally and externally. And um, both have been a struggle. You know, both have taken a lot of conversations and work and, you know, challenge um, and all of that. Yeah. But, you know, we are now um, a little over a decade old. The Climate Justice Alliance is about um, six years old. And, um, and a lot of those relationships predated that formation. And so 
I think just the capacity to continue to deepen, you know, again, like slow it, spread it, sink it, like actually deeply sink our roots into like, no, it's not just about this one decision or this one project. It's we're in it for the long term. Um, and let's clarify and get, and we can't do it all, you know? So, um, creating space for like, even when you see that things need to be done, like we're not the ones that have to do it all. Um, creating space for others to, to step into those roles or to expand their roles or, you know, I think all of those things are really, um, those are important. Yeah. That could be the, a perfect note to end on. I just want to make sure that, yeah, that folks in the, in the few minutes otherwise on the clock, uh, not to be so linear and obsessive about time, but <laughs> uh, it, like the self team or others uh, with any parting thoughts. Um, mm. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's a really juicy conversation. I think a lot of the questions that were raised are like, as you pointed out, not ones that can be solved with like a kind of template. And I think in part that's because it, they are, the responses really are so much about relationships. So we're also a legal organization and work with clients, but also with movement partners. And so we're really informed by um, movement lawyering as a sort of um, orientation. So like we're in reciprocal relationships with the folks we work with. So it's both about like being responsive, but also being in mutual accountability with each other. Um, and I think that there are formal ways to like build those relationships and there are informal ways. Some of it is just like sharing space together and, and listening to each other. And some of it is about like, yeah, who is on your board and who's your advisory board and what are the mechanisms for different folks to give feedback um, but one thing that David, like you're, when you originally were sharing that was kind of striking me was like, some of it's about, I think like synthesis, like who's, are you in a position to be like synthesizing a lot of disparate information? And like, maybe that is the unique role that you play. And so I think building on what we were just sharing, like being clear on like, what is what is your agency? Like, what are the things that each of our organizations are in the position to act on and not being afraid to exercise that, that perspective or that position and trusting that there, really, there are enough formal and informal mechanisms of accountability there that you'll get the feedback you need if you're doing something out of alignment. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. Well, folks, uh, yeah, I just love, I mean, just the vocabulary and then the imagery and the metaphors that each of you bring and then obviously rooted in the work that you're doing and the tour of the country that each of these conversations allows us um, with folks all over the place um, having the, the conversations that matter. So thank you all for this last hour and Michelle for anchoring this conversation um, for all the work you're doing and that you're all doing. Uh, so really. Yes, thank uh, you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thank you all. It's great to meet y'all See and see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool, and good thank luck. Thank you, everybody. It sounds like it's the long, the long horizon, but we're all, you know, we're all <laughs> in this conversation. And if anyone else, yeah, were to pipe to chime in, uh, we have, you know, a few more decades to get it right. And, and, and we're going to keep working. So I think it's really good to be with you all. Thank uh, you. Thank you thank so you much. Talk Take soon. Care, Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.